Hi there, and thank you so much for joining the Paula Fiscal Show. Today we have a very special guest by the name of Francisco Herrera, who happens to be the runner-up for the mayoral election that was held in San Francisco November 3rd, 2015. He has graciously, graciously agreed to join me to do some post-election analysis. Welcome, Francisco. Thank you. Buenas tardes, Paula. Happy to be with you. Well, why don't we just go right into asking you a few questions about the election and the results. And the first thing I'd like to do is to uh, share with the viewers that you have come up as the runner-up. Of course, in an election, there's only one winner. Mm -hmm. And in San Francisco, we had ranked choice voting mm -hmm. for the mayoral election. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how you were our runner-up and what the ranked choice voting means to those of us that are maybe not familiar with it. Yes, um, I think we got to be the runner-up, Paula, because uh, a lot of people kept saying your message is very clear and, uh, and I think it also reflects a real citizenry revolt that people have been feeling for a long time, very, very tired of the general angst that folks are feeling in terms of housing. There's a, there's a clear crisis, not, and it's not of housing, it's, a, it's of being displaced. So it's not like there's not enough space, there's not a priority that's being placed on people, on working people in San Francisco. And I, I keep on that because that's still the sentiment today, right? People are saying, how are we going to stay in San Francisco? Our children, our grandchildren, we need to change this situation in which investors are being allowed to come and displace us uh, in order to meet their priority, which is making a buck. You know, their bottom line is to make a buck, and they're an investment. I know that uh, you worked very hard to work with some of the other candidates, like uh, Ms. Well, Weiss and with uh, Mr. S uh, was Stewart. Brokeh Stewart. Yeah, you know, that, Stewart that's a, a very familiar yeah, name. From the, from the very start, we were clear that we were a people's campaign, that we were a people-powered uh, project, and we said two things. One, how do this problem, the housing crisis, the problem with education, the health, that all is really around peeping, people being able to live here is not going to be solved by one election. That was the first question we had. How do we really address the housing? And so we said we have to have a campaign that goes beyond the elections. And so we developed the People's Campaign. And there, therein lies the connecting factor then for the People's Campaign because on the same ballot was Prop I. Yes. And Prop I was everything about stopping and, and pausing the overdevelopment going on in the mission. And so, so then the person that went to the ballot, they voted for Prop I, yes, and then at the top of their ballot, there was the mayor's race. Yes. So that they hit the or made the line the black line across if they did it absentee like I did for Francisco Herrera mm -hmm. and then they had two more choices yes. so then they put another black line for Amy, Amy. Mm -hmm. Weiss. Weiss and then another black line for uh, Stuart, Stuart Schiffman. so when they did this when a voter went to the polls and voted for the housing issues then they also looked at the fact that those votes that they voted for the second and third choice and ranked choice voting, when they didn't go to the top, then those votes would also go to you. So was yes. th this a coordinated effort with the other campaigns? or You know or what it was a, from the or very... Or was this a surprise? No, no, from the very start, we, we 
shared that our our um actually all five of the candidates came from different parts of the city. It was very interesting and all very concerned about where the city's going. So that was really interesting that it was clearly a, like a citizen's revolt, you know, um, because we were all from different areas. But uh, with Amy and Stuart, we were able to establish a communication and say, do we do this? Do we do a one, two, and three? And what does it mean? And I think it became pretty clear for us that it meant, yes, let's, let's not throw stones or mud at each other because we have a clear uh, platform that is aiming for people to be able to have more decision-making power in the city as we're being kicked out of here across class, across groups, across ethnicities and religions. It's really kicking San Franciscans out of here is what's going on. And so we agreed to, each, each was going to run our own campaign, obviously, right? But, and then we were going to support saying, yes, vote for me one, but vote for Amy or Stewart. Amy said the same thing, vote for me, but vote for Stewart or Francisco, and Stewart the same, vote for me or Amy or Stewart. And uh, and actually, I believe Amy actually had a conversation with Reed, and and then I had a conversation also with Kent, but uh, you know, it's a, the voting is one, two, and three. That's right, the one, two, and three. Now, the other proposition that was related to housing we need to talk about Prop is F. Proposition F. Now, mm -hmm. last night there were um, final results pending on Prop F, and so we expect that that might change, but as of last night, uh, the Prop F people that wanted yes, and that was to limit the number of, of uh, nights that they could rent out, was winning. Now, mm -hmm. today, when I see the final result pending, it's, it's, it's very close yet. It's very close. 65, 66.6% 6 for yes and 55% for no. So we still have to go for another round. By the time uh, people, our viewers see this on Sundays, we'll have the final results. But this proposition had a good deal to do with a lot of the displacement issues. Very much so because... Uh, we're in a situation where people are not able to afford to live here. So by na it's one of these things like with Walmart, you know, you're you're placed in a situation where you don't have enough money to to buy, and and so you're pushed to the you're pushed to the lowest situation of of being able to use your money, and the same with this thing. You're in a place where you can't afford to live here, and you say, well, if I rent out a room for a few days. I'll literally be able to pay my month's rent, right? And so, and so, Prop F really does not hurt that person in that sense. But the but the no one Prop F campaign created a boogeyman situation, making everyone feel this is you're gonna have to spy on your friends and you're gonna have to do. And so it really scared a lot of people. And, and that was a concerted effort by yes. the campaign managers, yeah. because the one thing that always sells is fear. Fear. So That's they were right. fear mongers about the whole issue. But the real issue is that there are 7,299 units for rent in San Francisco, and mm -hmm. only 700 have registered. Now, I understand that our, our assemblyman, David Chu, had originally put this legislation on the, um, on the charter when he was here as a, as a supervisor. However, not enough money was budgeted to yeah. actually have rental monitors or exactly. rental administrators that could actually enforce yeah. and yeah. mandate this legislation and this registration. But on the upside, and we need to talk a few about a bit about the upside, and we also need to talk a little bit about the uh, other propositions, and, uh, but uh, I want to talk about the other propositions first, and then we'll go back to talking about some of the housing issues, if okay. that's okay with you. Sure, okay? Paula. We want to go over the, for example, Proposition B, paid parental leave for city employees. That passed. Okay, yes. so that was a and yes. that's really good. And that's uh, for me, that's a really important piece because it's not all about wages. You know, we have to realize that when we organize, we're or we need to organize quality of life issues. Yes, yes. And and this is one. There was a good step towards this kind of issue of quality oh, of life. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so let's go on to Prop C, 
the expenditure lobbyists, that came in with a yes, a resounding yes. Uh, that means then that a lot of the nonprofits are going to have to report how many cups of coffee they bought for an elected exactly. official. Yeah. But and it's really tedious. That it's might gonna, change, too, because, take, no, it's not going to change because that one's got 74, 75%, yeah, no, that, and the no's were 25%. Yeah. So that's definitely going to hold it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And the big the big organizations cannot can can deal with that, but the smaller nonprofits are going to be gonna very be tough. hurt. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a lot of administrative work. All right, let's talk about Prop D, the Mission Rock development. Now, on that one, I don't have any results whatsoever, and it just says final result pending. Yeah. So that's a little bit. Uh, you know, I mean, we're sorry about that, but by by Sunday, er, everything will have cleared up. We hope. Let's yes. go on to Prop E, the mm -hmm. requirement for public meetings. That went down with a resounding no. Yes, okay, correct, so and that that's was good. No. That was that's good. Okay. Anyone somewhere in the world could join a meeting from, <laughs> but through internet and that's right. be deciding for San Franciscans. Exactly, and the board of supervisors can take that up anyway. They that's don't right. need to have a, a ballot or a proposition online on on the ballot. Uh, all right, let's go back. We're jumping around a little bit, but that's okay. That's okay. Proposition H, defining clean, green, and renewable energy. That Very passed with good. a resounding yes. Once again, it'll help our questions about affordability. Prop H is going to help us deal with affordability in the area of, of energy. So it's very good. Okay, now let's go to Prop J, the Legacy Business Historic Preservation Fund. That needs 66%. It only came in at 56%. But again, it's the final very result positive. is pending. Yeah. So we won't know about and that one until later. It's a small step. We need to take a lot of steps for that one in terms yes. of what are what are legacy businesses number one that's right and really how much uh we can support legacy businesses because at this point i think it's like 500 dollars per employee that goes to the employer that's not right. to the employee that's right and <laughs> and the uh the uh rental is going to be subsidized at 150 dollars or something like Algo that per seen, square yeah. foot yeah so that's going to be that'll be administered out of a separate office, I believe. Yeah. And they, they will get more staff people. It's a good small step. And then uh, Prop K, surplus public funds, that passed. Mm -hmm. uh, a resounding yes. So we have that. And then let's talk, let's talk a lot about District 3. Yes. District yeah. 3. All right. For those of you that may not have been familiar with District 3. District 3 was Aaron Peskin running for his old seat because Aaron Peskin used to be the president of the board and he had already been elected for two terms and then he took a, a, a break because it was termed out. Right. Now, Ed Lee had appointed Ms. Christensen in January and her job was to be a yes vote for Ed Lee, mm -hmm. clearly. Yes. Because that was all she could do in the time that she was a supervisor. But when Aaron ran, what he ran on, again, was the housing issue. Exactly. And I think our big meeting in May 8th, when we took over City Hall for those hearings, and June 2nd, when we took over again City Hall, on the issue of housing and on the issue of limiting luxury housing, uh, her vote against the population, against the citizenry of San Francisco, was really part of what I think cost her this election. I think that has to be a very clear message, both to Mayor Ed Lee and to other supervisors. The citizens of, of San Francisco, the people of San Francisco, are very concerned about the future of our city. And I just wanted to mention that um, a couple of the other elections for sheriff, uh, Vicki Hennessy was elected as the new sheriff. Yeah, that's a real travesty of justice, I think, because a, a whole campaign of defamation was created against the most progressive sheriff. You know, when I saw that that uh, Ross won that uh, national award for the most innovative uh, government programming, and and the Lee administration and the, the city hall refused to pay any attention to something that honored San Francisco, not just the sheriff, but San Francisco was put in the limelight, not just in the United States, Paula, around the world. And they decided to play politics and, and block any of the positive things. 
it, it, for me it was like wow this is this administration is really does not have the best interest of San Francisco and I suspect uh, that the present uh, Sh sheriff Hennessy who's going to take over in January does not have the best interest of San Francisco either for because because of what happened and how politics was played and the defamation of character and administration of Ross. So we're going to have to be very vigilant to what we San Franciscans have won in, in the past with Hennessy, the, old, the previous Hennessy with Mark Remy, and now uh, all of those programs I think are under threat. We have to be very vigilant. And uh, if you've just joined us, we are doing a post election analysis with Francisco Herrera on all of the propositions on the ballot in San Francisco. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. This is the Paula Fiscal Show. It airs on Sundays at 3 o'clock p.m. on Channel 29. And we also have a Facebook page. You should remember to use the Twitter handle, Paula Fiscal Show. And uh, use a hashtag for SF Commons because then you'll notify them that you're actually watching this show. Mm -hmm. And now then, let us get back to the first Paul Fiscal show post-election analysis. And I'm going to ask our expert, Francisco Herrera, if he sees any trends or if he saw any trends in the election uh, of the mayor compared to his voters, and how does he see the ranked choice voting influencing how he came in as the strong runner-up with, is it 39% of the at vote? This point, at this point, I believe it's 39.5% uh, and climbing. And so, um, yeah, ranked choice voting for me, I've always, I was part of the folks who brought it in too in terms of voting for it, in terms of supporting it, and it gives the voter more more strength, it eliminates the costly runoff elections one month later or whenever it is. That was the theory in, to begin with, that right. there shouldn't be any more costly runoff elections. Yeah. But yet, as you and I discussed earlier, the whole ranked choice process is so skewed that people don't understand that if they go to the yes. ballots and vote just once, their other two votes don't count. That's right. There are two votes so count, and so that need, there needs to be, and that was one of the things that we discovered in the process this election, right? There needs to be far more education as to how ranked choice voting helps the voter, not just how it works, but how it actually helps the voter, because it's very, it's a very useful tool, but you have to be educated in the process and knowing how it works. It's very useful. Well, when it was first put out the Department of Elections actually sent out people that would show people how to vote. And I don't think they, I don't know if they did that this last time. Did you see anybody in the community? No, it's dropped. I got to commend the, the Department of Election folks on the what they've done. I know that they go every year a couple times in Spanish and work with people in the Spanish-speaking community of how it uh, voting and registration, all that. So that's commendable. I think there needs to be that same kind of attention and more to how ranked choice voting works and in general to the how um, people with who have a second language or a first language that is not English, uh, that needs to happen too. But definitely on the one, two, three, there needs to be more attention. And let's look uh, just a little bit now at the next steps because the next steps here number one Aaron Peskin is going yes. to be back on the Board of Supervisors good that news that is going to that's very good news I see change the um, makeup of any of the issues that come up in front that have to go to the mayor yeah very very good news we support it full heartedly the we couldn't vote those of us outside of district 3 obviously couldn't vote for Aaron but we wholeheartedly supported that because now we have more leverage to be able to push issues like eviction 2.0 that we were able to push actually thanks to this election process we were able to win that and pressure the city hall to do that but now we're going to have to keep working uh, twice as hard 
to be able to stop luxury housing for people who do not live here and create affordable housing for city workers, for families, for working families in general in San Francisco. The thing for me about Prop I is that we need to implement it citywide, right? And that was the thinking, let's start with a mission because there's such a crisis. But the reality of it is that there's a crisis citywide and we need to implement the holding off of luxury apartments and working at affordable housing citywide. And Prop I was what uh, we were able to tell, an initiative that was just real clean cut. It wasn't confusing. No. There, mm -hmm. Yes didn't mean no, and no didn't mean exactly. yes. Exactly. <laughs> and, and because of this, I believe that when the uh, yes on I people were talking about putting a pause in, and we had Christina Olagi, this former supervisor here, talking with us, it still yet did not hit all of the, the people in the city because they thought it was just something that was happening in the mission. Correct, which is the typical problem in most big cities and definitely in San Francisco is that people say, oh, it's that neighborhood. Okay, well, it's not really uh, have to do with me. And that's for me, that's the challenge that it now has presented to us San Franciscans in the year 2015. We love our neighborhoods. We love and defend the, the diversity and the uniqueness of our neighborhoods. But now we need to start planning collectively about San Francisco because what they're doing is they're destroying neighborhood by neighborhood. These investors that call themselves developers uh, but really our investors are going neighborhood by neighborhood. And when we see something beautiful happening like like the uh, electric, like the muni that goes through third street now we think oh wonderful we're beautifying our neighborhood no not necessarily what's happening is that they're planning to displace us and so finally they're moving away from blight and developing the neighborhood because they're planning to displace us and so this is where we need to start thinking citywide develop and defend our neighborhoods from our, our point of view well francisco I know that your campaign and uh, all of your volunteers worked very, very hard very to hard. see you uh, get elected. And in a sense, because you came in as a runner-up with 39% of the vote. And uh, that climbing. Was, and climbing. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that really does influence and motivate Latinos that live and work yes. in San Francisco. And... Uh, encourages participation. So what would you advise our communities to do now for the next steps? Uh, I would advise our communities of all the ethnic groups, of all the neighborhoods, to really engage through your community, through your church group, through your union, through your social group, really engage on the question, what do I want for San Francisco in the future, in the next 5, 10, 20 years? And based on that question, say, I am the developer of San Francisco, and I have to be more active politically, socially, culturally in my city to make it work, because the investors are coming to displace us, and we can make a difference to stay here and flourish and make a, continue to make a beautiful city that really engages in the idea of health, of education, of housing, and, and relieving that stress that we're all feeling right now. Now, before we close, is there any particular next step for people that have worked on your campaign specifically? Yeah, I really want to commend and thank the volunteers because it and was names. a full. Yeah, Cristina Herrera, my wife, Miguel Perez, our campaign manager, este, verdad, very, very helpful. Eh, um, a, este, ¿cómo se llama? Alice Cerantes, our volunteer coordinator, the youth, Alma Herrera Pazmiño, Camilo Perez, Ana, Ana Quiñones, who were our volunteers that helped with Facebook, with uh, uh, Josh Wolf that helped with the Nation Builder page, este, 
and Diego, a wonderful volunteer who helped in so many ways. This was really a volunteer <laughs> campaign. Everyone donated time and money from all the districts. People came from all the districts. It took us over 300 people that really put together the platform, Paula. So it really was across unions, across sectors, across churches. It was really a whole community of San Franciscans that put our platform together. And that's why we were able to get this, this percentage because it really was people from all the institutions, universities, schools, churches, throughout the neighborhoods, from the Bayview to the Golden Gate. And earlier you were commenting on the number of people that were reaching out to you and with the number of issues that uh, they were bringing to your attention. And you kept hearing the same thing over and over again, which was yeah. housing. Well, it was how, how do we stay in San Francisco? In the process of doing this election, we, we lost at least 12 neighbors, at least from different, from the Sunset, from the Bayview, from the Mission, obviously, from the Excelsior. People said, well, Francisco, I'll help you, but I'm moving out next week. I'm moving out next month. I, I make $110,000 here, and I'm moving out in a month and a half because I, I work for the city, and I can't afford to live here. That's what's happening right now. Now, wait a minute. You're telling me that city employees can't C afford to live here? City. Maybe we're going to have to put something on the ballot to make sure that the city employees that work for us yes. can afford to live here. City employees cannot afford to live here. And there was a tragedy. There was a lot of deaths, actually, and a heavy tragedy that happened three weeks ago of a young man who was killed. And in the process, we were able to, to support that family as well. So we're facing serious tragedies, serious situations. We have to get organized as the San Franciscans. Well, I want to thank you very much, Francisco Herrera who was a candidate for mayor, who is now the runner-up with 39% mm -hmm. plus and still climbing uh, percentage points. And we want to encourage all of the, you that are watching this show to please keep active. And by all means, if you would like to contact our runner-up, Francisco Herrera, he's going to give you his email. That's right. Francisco Herrera, H-E-R-R-E-R-A, 001 at gmail.com. And also 415-812-9362. Peoplescampaign.net is our website. Peoplescampaign.net. So this campaign is going to continue. Oh, yeah, that's the plan. The 12-year plan, ladies and gentlemen. We have to plan and execute in a, in a way that says we are here to stay. What does San Francisco look like for our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren? So there you have it. Thank you so much for joining us. And remember to watch the show at 3 o'clock p.m. on Sundays. And go to YouTube, and you can watch all the shows. Again, thank you so much for joining us, and stay informed.